the our speaker tonight. So sit back and enjoy. Hi everyone. Yeah, thank you for the invitation, and uh, I will try. Yeah, so um, the host disabled participant screen sharing. Could you please enable? Okay, there we go. Do it again. Um, desktop one. Okay. okay, hi everyone again, and thank you for the invitation. This is my first slide. It's kind of an introductory slide, very busy one, but the main points here, I'm a scientist. Um, I surf on a CRFG board. I'm a obsessive gardener and um, just now transferring into being a farmer. We just planted with my husband together over 600 trees uh, and those ones are in the proper orchard setting. Currently I work for um, Fringe Coffee. It's a company which, um, oh, let me try to reduce this one. I don't know if you see it. Uh, my company, um, our goal is to make uh, Southern California the next specialty coffee capital of the world. And we also have um, exotic fruit farm uh, where you can buy uh, various exotic fruits. So websites are here. You can, uh, you can check them um, um, when you have time. So, but I think the, the next slide, how do I move it? Let me see. Yeah, so the next slide probably resonates better uh, with introduction myself to this audience. Uh, and this slide is about what do I care about and what do I do about in terms of growing rare fruits and popularizing rare fruits. I'm very much care about preservation and popularization of fruit diversity. What do I do? I grow and I distribute fruits and plant material. And recently, as I already mentioned, we started a new orchard. I got a lease for 15 years on uh, four acres. And right now we just developed just uh, about one and a half acres and we planted uh, over 600 trees. I also care about documentation of the knowledge we create about rare fruits. Uh, what is this about? The problem is what I found on the internet, uh, there is very limited information about the cultivars we're growing. And I think that's a problem because there is lots of knowledge gets lost. And what I do about it, uh, years ago, I started my own personal blog, and by now I already have there about, uh, not about exactly 142 posts and just a new post. I specifically put together because I was holding on it. I was going to do it for about one month already, but finally I published it today. I also serve on the board as a fruit variety registrar and um, I register new cultivars which were selected by, um, by our members. So every year we publish in the Fruit Gardener magazine, we publish um, newly registered cultivars. So we evaluate the submissions and then we issue certificates and we do publications in the Fruit Gardener about these cultivars. And I also very much interested in finding the optimal uh, plant propagation techniques. And for that, I experiment with various rooting and grafting methods. And in my last post, uh, which I will mention today, um, I'm, I'm talking about root grafting. It's an old, old technique, old method, but it's not commonly used, especially now, especially in this part of the world. In Southern uh, Hemisphere, I think, or in the Asian countries, even in Northern Hemisphere, that, uh, that technique is used uh, more often than it's used in North America. So um, in different degrees, I'm going to touch all these topics, but mostly I'm going to talk about the fruits I grow and um, 
what my experience with finding a new exciting fruits. Uh, so that will be the topic today, uh, growing uncommon subtropical fruits and the central valley. So I live in Davis, uh, we are very hot in summer, we are pretty cold in winter. And I'm going to touch on many of these fruits uh, displayed on this slide. But the backbone of my presentation for today will be the seasonality. And I think what is important for many, especially for me, it's very important to have to be able to harvest fruit every month, every week, and ideally even every day from my yard or from my future farm. Uh, back in 16 and 17, so what I did, uh, it's one of my older posts on my blog, I actually recorded a fruit harvest for entire year. At that time, it's over five years ago, I grew lesser amount of cultivars and fruits, but nevertheless, I basically was able to cover the entire year with some kind of fruits. So, um, and you can find this post on my blog, but of course it's very difficult to read on this slide, but um, the main point, if you are just starting or you're going to diversify or you're going to eat some fruits in some in the season where you don't have many fruits, just look at this list and pick something from this list uh, for spring, summer, fall, and winter of the fruits which uh, might uh, might fill the gaps in your harvest. So I'm I'm going to go through many of this uh, many of these fruits in the presentation. But I grow all of this and actually more. But um, these fruits very well will cover cover the entire year with the harvest. Where I drew my experiences from. So where did I learn this all? Two locations. I garden at two locations. And now the third location, actually, I finished in Vacaville, but I started an orchard, new orchard in Woodland. So in Davis, uh, my house, it's a typical suburban lot, um, small, relatively small lot, I believe, points, yeah, point 0.17 acres I have it here. It's a corner lot. Uh, it means I have a huge front yard, smaller backyard, uh, but it's over 20 years. So my first trees I planted, they were planted around, yeah, 2001, probably 2003, like my avocado is from 2001. It's pretty mature tree now. This location is also much more protected than any farm setting. For example, when uh, in Vacaville, the Vacaville orchard, it was it is orchard of my friends. It's a farm of my friends where I had a chance to, um, to grow a lot of things for six years. And it's uh, very open. It's an open farm land with air masses uh, moving um, very fast. It means that in summer it's hotter, in winter it's colder. There are no um, there are no microclimates which I could use. I still use the walls of the building, but um, otherwise it's still it's much much open. So city locations always much better protected. We have lots of asphalt um, buildings um, and more dense plantings, etc. So like in Davis, I could grow even dragon fruits, which are zone 10 plant and we are 9B. In Davis, I could grow basically, yeah, I could grow more of uh, exotics than I ever would be able to grow in an uh, in open farmland. Uh, but growing things in open in larger spaces allows uh, for more experimentation, of course. So let's start from spring. Um, all these all this plants, all these fruits, I, uh, which listed here, shown here, I fruited. But I want to concentrate on just uh, four species here, um, or even four cultivars here. Um, for you, of course, it's very easy to grow guavas, tropical guavas, I think for most of you, maybe some people are uh, a little bit inland and that might get, bring some challenges. For us, tropical guava is not something, uh, something um, common grown here, but it's possible to grow here uh, by the walls. 
avocados become um, more and more common here in Sacramento. Uh, of course, we have late citrus, we grow plenty of mulberries, we grow cherries. Uh, Suriname cherry, I'm going to talk in more detail. And in spring, we can get already early peaches. Right now, I'm harvesting Orion. It's a very early peach from, um, from South Africa. Early apricots are fruiting now. I'm harvesting uh, flavored delight and um, white knockout. Uh, tons of loquats now, and of course, strawberries. But let's start from the species, uh, from the cultivars I selected here. So avocado, royal right. Let's start, let's start from this avocado. Basically, the first thing I want to tell you, you don't need this avocado. If you are in mild coastal climate where you can grow 200 other cultivars of avocados. But if you are in a harsh environment where you have troubles uh, getting fruits from spring, spring fruiting avocados, this is an avocado for you. Uh, I named this avocado Royal Right because that's a, that's a cross uh, corner of this street. So basically there is a house in Santa Rosa where people had this particular tree in their backyard. And uh, they allowed me to collect the signs and this tree turned out to be very precocious, very vigorous, fast growing and with pretty good fruits. They are not as um, complex and um, dense um, or oily as uh, many other avocados, you know, but um, they're pretty good. So uh, back in 2016, I collected cuttings from the yard and immediately made uh, trees on, um, on Duke seedlings and planted them in 2016 in Vacaville by the wall of the building over there by Western, by no, sorry, by Eastern Wall and by Southern Wall. And what I found at that time that Eastern Wall actually provides better protection than Southern Wall. It is because of when we have um, night frosts, night winter frosts, Eastern Wall is actually getting heat faster from the rising sun than Southern Walls in winter. So on the left, you see the tree from um, Eastern Wall and in the, mi oops, and in the middle, uh, the tree is from the Southern Wall. So these are um, two years old trees, which were, pla which were planted in ground when they were really tiny seedlings in 2016. And by 2020, this tree became a fully mature, um, huge above the roof uh, tree. So the, the blooming started uh, in second year and since ripening time between uh, exactly one year actually from April to March. Um, so in three years, you can get fruits already from this avocado. It gets a little bit frosted. Um, uh, when we when the um, temper, winter temperature went down to 23, but it's a, such a fast and strong grower, it immediately regrows back. Um, and it produces tons of fruits. So these are the fruits probably from the, uh, yeah, so yeah, so it's April 2020 fruits from 2019 bloom, and it already was the second fruiting. So the previous year, I already had few fruits, but not as many as in 2020. So, and this was uh, basically my introduction through CRFG, we registered this cultivar and uh, I think it's very useful for us here and uh, might be useful for some of you in the harsh area of Southern California. Now we'll move to mulberries. And yeah, and I'm happy to answer any questions, uh, but we probably should hold for them until the end, just for me to go through the, through the presentation faster. But it's up to the organizers how you want to structure this. Um, anyway, so I'm moving to mulberries. And uh, for the mulberries, I grow a lot of cultivars. Many of these listed here, I actually now grow more than what is listed here. And the spring fruitings 
Uh, mostly uh, alba, yes, alba and macrura, mostly spring fruitings. Actually, some albas will continue fruiting into the, into the summer, and some macruras actually also will be fruiting uh, later too, later in the season too. But nigra or Persian mulberry will start fruiting for me only from probably early July here. And a few cultivars I want to point out. First of all, I want to point out Four Seasons Mulberry or Taiwanese Four Seasons. Very interesting characteristic of this mulberry, it can fruit from now, well, earlier from now, in your situation, it probably will be fruiting from February into December at least. Actually, spring fruits are not that tasty and not that sugary, but starting from end of June, this is excellent mulberry starting from end of June into December. It, it might be actually be truly overbearing because I planted a number of these bushes um, at uh, my, farm, my company farm in Galita, it's a Santa Barbara area. And I was picking fruits there, I believe in January or February and they've been pretty good. So this is truly overbearing uh, and it's a small mulberry, it's a small, relatively small tree or large bush and fruits uh, fruits all the time during the year so this is um this is a mulberry so the fruits are not very large but um uh but um there are there are tons of them produced on the tree pakistan everyone knows pakistan everyone should grow pakistan so i'm not going to talk much about it but it's an excellent mulberry everyone should have it and that's actually available um available in large nurseries so if you ever come across of this tree buy, buy the tree and have it in your yard if you don't have it yet the other type of mulberries i grow is this long white type uh three different accessions came to me from different sources and they were labeled as saharan poor local australian green and pakistan white after evaluation for a few years, I realized that basically it is the same thing. I could not see any differences between these three, mulberry, three mulberries, and I consider them the same, but I still keep them under, under all these names because who knows, maybe under certain conditions, certain stress conditions, certain pest pressures, maybe they will become different. But so far, no difference in taste, um, no, difference, um, no difference in seasonality or growth patterns. Buluklu, it's a white, it's a white, relatively small mulberry, uh, which fruits around June, early June for me, very sweet, uh, no acidity, but it's very, very productive. So it fruits after I'm basically done with, um, uh, with many other mulberries, like at that time, I usually already don't have Pakistan or Pakistan white, um, but Buluklu is producing abundantly. So it's a, like a late May, early June mulberry for me. Excellent mulberry is this one, Zimur uh, Himalayan. Zimur is basically stands, this is a name uh, or this is idea which you will find at the USDA. So this mulberry available from USDA, it's a Davis Morus 9 accession basically. And um, it looks like there are multiple strains of Himalayans um, floating around and I'm starting to collect uh, as many as I can and I will evaluate them on my farm soon. But this was the first one which I came across at this came directly from USDA, well, through the, through the friend, but he got it from USDA. And this is very different from Pakistan. First of all, all it's earlier. It also buds out earlier. So this is actually not the best accession for the areas with late frosts because it doesn't wait to bud out as many white mulberries do like, um, like Buluklu and other white mulberries from Middle East, they will wait, or mulberries from Ukraine, they will wait to bud out until, you know, there are consistent worms. This, uh, this will not. And that's a danger because it will start developing fruits and then we have late frost and it will be frozen. And then you have to wait for another flash of growth to get, to get the fruits. 
but the fruits are excellent fruits are very complex i would say i i i, I say that yes they are sweeter than pakistan they are more complex than pakistan they are excellent Another mulberry idea. So basically, this is another cultivar I'm trying to popularize and introduce and distribute. This is a mulberry black prince. I found an old tree in um, at north of Sacramento, with uh, in the backyard of some uh, older couple from former Soviet Union. And the people who grafted them the trees, they even not here anymore. So basically, it was a long time introduced to the US and somehow didn't get any distribution. And I'm actually very surprised that this didn't get into distrib wider distribution because it's very easily roots. So first, when I got this mulberry, I just grafted it because I wasn't sure it will root. But now you can see that it can be rooted from green wood, it can be rooted from uh, dormant wood, and it can be grafted. So it's not a problem to, uh, to propagate this mulberry at all. It's very large fruits, very complex fruits. Um, usually June fruiting, if it's on ground outside and open spaces, but potted plant right now is fruiting in my yard and I picking fruits now already probably for a good month from that tree. So if it's kind of, yeah, but this mulberry will not bud uh, out early. So it came from Ukraine. It's actually waits. It's waits to bud out uh, until there is a consistent warmth and then it buds out. So there is no chance of losing your fruits uh, with this mulberry. The fruits are also pretty firm. I think this is one of those mulberries like Pakistan, which actually has a potential, some commercial potential for at least farmers markets uh, or local local markets. And it's a, it's, this mulberry should be very cold tolerant. It's not a problem for you and I, uh, but um, people grow it up to southern Finland. So the point is that uh, mulberries, they definitely deserve better distribution. I hope you all grow at least some, and I hope I I'm, uh, you got a little bit more interested and in, to grow something beyond Pakistan. And it would be nice if um, a large commercial nursery would start doing something about it. Uh, I think the problem, the main problem with mulberries uh, or with many mulberries is that they're not all root. Many mulberries will not root. And uh, because I started distributing these long white ones, Australian green, Himalayan, uh, Dimor, and yeah, so this is not white, but um, uh, the white is Pakistan white, Sakharanpur local. I distributed them. I covered the benches, tables on our sign exchanges like five, six, seven years ago. And people still don't have them because I, fr I suspect that people try to root them and their rooting efficiency is incredibly low. Maybe 1%, 2% you can root, but you have to start with 100 cuttings. People usually take one, two, three cuttings and they start rooting them as it's not going to happen. So, um, and I think, yeah, so basically, I think Pakistan from Makrura species, Pakistan is an exception. It can be rooted, but it looks like that most Himalayans and um, long whites, they cannot be rooted. And that's a limitation for the distribution. They, they have to be grafted. Okay, I'm done with mulberries. I'm moving on to loquats. Um, loquats, I evaluated a number of cultivars. Um, right now, I already even have more than this, but um, and yeah, and that fruited more than here. So I also fruited um, besides this ones, Albert Sorli Italian, Ar Argelina Brandeton, as Delight, Fletcher White, etc. Also graph, I also fruited Mogi, Espana, Jazzy, and a few others. And uh, up to now, actually, yeah, up to now, actually, from all the cultivars I evaluated. I think Argelino, for me, universally um, the best cultivar. But keep in mind that Argelino should be perfectly ripe. Because if you pick it too early, it will have too much acid and people will not like it. 
So, but when it's perfectly ripe, it's a really uh, flavor bomb, I would say. Um, it has a lot of different flavors in it, almost like a mango um, and has acidity and um, and general, generally it's extremely good fruits and uh, they also can be really large. So um, if you have, if you get a chance, yeah, grow Argelino. I recommend Argelino to everyone. Uh, if you like white loquats, so Argelino is an orange loquat. If you like white loquats, I found that Fletcher White and Ed's Delight are excellent loquats too. But with Fletcher White, for example, you also should wait until it's fully ripe. When it's fully ripe, it's very, it's pretty complex. It has this pear, strawberry, grape flavor in them. They also form a huge clusters of fruits. Um, if you like loquats on a larger size and not with lesser acidity, uh, for white ones, Ed Delight is probably the next one I would I would recommend. So it's always larger than clusters are not so large, but the fruits are larger, a, li a little bit less acidity, but it's also a little bit um, less complex in flavor. If you like a look what um, with less acidity, but still with some, so that's a Kando or Kandro cultivar. It also makes large fruits. It's a simpler in flavor, but you can eat it early. And um, um, it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's a little bit simpler, simpler in flavor, but it's overall, it's still very good loquat. And uh, some people actually prefer Kanda to Argelino, but it's, it's always a matter of your preference. Um, and uh, yeah, it's always uh, good to grow a number. So there are some cult loquat cultivars I eliminated completely. I grew Albert's early Italian, and I didn't like it at all. I didn't like it at all. Brandenton, and I saw that gold nugget is too simple, and I eliminated that one too. But right now, the new farm, I believe I already planted like 25 loquats and um, maybe at least 21, 22 different cultivars. So I will be evaluating more, more of them. So best performance I hear on the right and this list, Argelino, Fletcher White, Kondo, Ed's Delight, Jazzy Mogi, and Espana. And I'm pretty sure in a few years, I will add some more and maybe I'll remove some of this. So next spring fruit I'm moving on is uh, Suriname cherry. It's also my introduction, Guaruja Red, I call it, because um, Original seed is from the city of Guarujo in Brazil. And these fruits, they are not very large if you compare them with some other Suriname cherries, but they are excellent in flavor. They are complex and they have citrusy notes. And this particular tree is a very fast and very vigorous grower. It's um, it's above of my house uh, roof now, not the two stories, but about above of the first, um, first uh, story. So it, it grew very straight and upright, not very typical for Suriname cherries you usually, you usually get in nurseries. Um, this tree always, the first fruits from this tree always seedless and small, like the first kind of a flush. And the second flush from this tree, they're overlapping. I still, right now on my tree, I have a few seedless fruits and I have already a lot of uh, fruits ripening with the seeds. So um, it's very unusual. And I think it's, uh, I spoke with um, Brazilian, um, Brazilian um, specialist, uh, and he told me that it's probably in subspecies Deciblastum. So it's um, Eugenia uniflora subspecies Deciblastum. Uh, but I suspect it's probably not pure Deciblasta, it's probably hybrid. And uh, let me tell you why. Because the tree, the fruits I ate in Brazil were orange and smooth. So you ate these fruits, I planted seed. Three years later, I'm harvesting dark red, almost black fruits. I'm very disappointed. 
first, but then I'm tasting them and uh, they're pretty good. So I decided to keep this tree and start propagating it. And I also initiated a few years ago uh, this kind of a distributed this I, I distributed seeds hoping that we will do um, distributed phenotyping projects, basically giving seeds to a lot of people and then trying to get back from them information on the qualities of the seedlings. So, and I told them to grow the, the seedlings like in a one trunk, try to keep it straight. Basically, if you're keeping your Suriname cherries uh, straight as a single, uh, single leader, and then let it uh, branch above three, four feet, um, you have a better chance of um, early fruiting for this, particular, for, for this particular species than if you leave it like a ground cover. So, and I also planted a number of this, a uh, number of the seedlings from my tree. I hope to recover uh, as a back yellow because most likely the, fruit I ate was pollinated with some other pitanga from a dark tree by some bee or who knows what is flying in Brazil. And uh, that's why I have this cross. And I hope that when I will start growing, oops, sorry, growing seedlings, I will get uh, back, at least some of them will be, will be this light um, orange color. So far, however, on the seedlings I planted, I only collected dark, uh, dark fruits, but uh, there are lots of uh, segregation in the fruit morphology, uh, not in fruit morphology, sorry, in the leaf morphology. So I can see that some of my trees have very different leaves and those ones didn't fruit yet. So I'm waiting for my orange pitanga. Okay, I'm done with the spring and I'm moving to summer. Summer in Central Valley, it provides abundance with fruits. We have tons of, so, we have tons of uh, stone fruits, we have cherries, we have summer citrus, we have various berries, um, uh, even early apples, and I produce some dragon fruits, um, grapes, figs, of course. Um, but the three uh, cultivars I decided to select for this presentation is these ones or types of fruits. Sour cherry, dwarf grumichama, and oak leaf papaya, simply because they're not something people commonly grow here. Let's start with sour cherries. Back in 2018, I ordered a number of um, accessions uh, from USD station in uh, New York, in Geneva, in New York State. And they sent me 12 different accessions of sour cherries. I also collected additional accessions from uh, friends um, here around in the Bay Area mostly. And I grafted them on a couple of different rootstocks and I planted them in Vacaville Orchard. And um, sour cherry is not something very precocious so i'm still uh, like it was 2018 now 2022 i have some information but not for all cultivars and i just moved a number of them uh, to new orchard and i also made new trees of the of some of most of these cultivars i made new trees too and i'm going to evaluate them evaluate them for much longer but one cultivar uh, showed um, really great potential in my situation because you see sour cherry is not something you grow in California. Uh, most of places are just too hot and uh, also many places don't provide enough chill. But my place uh, in Wackerville Farm was actually exceptional. So we have really high chill there. So the chill is not a problem, but it's just uh, instability of weather is a problem. But cultivar with the name Sumadinka, I believe this is a Russian cultivar, but I need to check exactly from each, which European country it came. Um, showed really great potential. So um, it was precocious, it was fruiting abundantly, it can be grafted on sweet cherries and start producing the following year. I actually grafted it on Royal Rainier and it started producing right away. 
And it's a typical sour cherry. So it's not a Duke type. If you heard of Duke types cherry, which I'm holding here, Duke type cherry is a hybrid between sweet and sour cherries, which are on more on the sweet side. But uh, Sumadinka is actual, um, is actual uh, real sour cherries. We typically can get somewhere from Northern part of the United States, like from Michigan or maybe from Washington state. So the other cultivars which showed nice potential is Bell Magnific. Duke produced quite a bit. Uh, Pamit Vavilova is a clearly Russian cultivar. It's in the name of a uh, uh, great Russian breeder Vavilov. Uh, producing this year, I finally tasted some fruits. Uh, Vladimirska is an old Russian cultivar. It's also producing now. So there is a potential. Oops. Oh, why I'm clicking? Yeah. So there is a potential for um for uh, producing sour cherries. So right now, the only orchard which produces sour cherry, to my knowledge, the only orchard that produces sour cherry in California is Andes Orchard and Morgan Hill. So, and uh, last time I checked, um, they're going to have some very limited uh, quantity of sour cherries soon. Otherwise, uh, you would have to um, go somewhere else or buy them frozen. And uh, I really like sour cherries. I grew with them in Uzbekistan. Yeah, I'm, I'm myself from Uzbekistan. It was a part of Soviet Union. And uh, our sour cherries were absolutely huge trees with a huge, very nice fruits. So um, moving along. So next fruit I'm going to present is dwarf grumi chamam. Dwarf Grumichan also came from Brazil. It's a seedling which I started myself about three or four years ago. It's precocious. Uh, it's very unusual fruit, and it seems that it's um, it's a frost resistant. It's a heat resistant, but it requires quite a bit of water during fruit uh, development. I still have my tree in pot simply because I don't have time to put it in somewhere, but I will put it in, but probably in beginning just in my backyard because I don't want to lose this tree in the open farm setting, but I'm definitely going to make an air layer and try growing it on the big farm too. My uh, family, my husband and my son are saying them that the taste um, is like a flavor is like blueberry, but it's not what I taste when I taste these fruits. They are sweet, they have this myrtaceous flavor because it's Eugenie, it's from myrtaceous. So um, it's very complex and nice fruits, that's all I can say, yeah. So, uh, uh, and it's very black and orange inside, yeah. And it produces abundantly. It's like you get the same amount you would get from blueberries, probably uh, from the same type of the bush. And uh, yeah, lots of flowers. The foliage is very ornamental. This I have, yeah, I covered it with surround uh, simply because uh, we were getting a heat wave of over 100. So sometimes I cover my, my plants I want to protect with surround. The surround is a curling clay just to protect from sunburns. Okay, the next fruit I'm moving on for the summer is oak leaf, leaf papaya. So since I'm in Davis, I'm in Central California, I don't, I cannot really grow uh, tropical papayas here. I tried, I tried tropical papayas, I tried mountain papaya. And mountain papaya was good for me for about a year, but it's died this spring because we had late frost. So for me, the real option outside is this type of papaya. It's basically a papaya berry. They come uh, as dioecious plants, so they can be males, so they can be females. In 2017, I planted four seedlings, which I got the previous uh, fall from um, uh, CRFG colleague, uh, Brian Lavin. He uh, just saved the seedlings and I thought, okay, I will try. And the funny thing about this species is that it actually can easily take 23 degrees. Like, yeah, I forgot to mention when I was talking about avocados, um, that avocado I was talking about um, actually tolerates range of temperatures between 23 and 110. 
the same for this thing. So it, um, it's fine. It's fine with frost. I, of course, planted it by the wall because I didn't know what's going to happen, but uh, it's not every year we are getting into um, 23 degrees. But this, these plants uh, take it fine. So the size of the fruits is about a little bit larger than uh, small grapes, small seedless grapes. The flavor for me, it's a flavor of a condensed milk, condensed sweetened milk. When I when I when I bite into the into the fruits, into the berries. But if you also bite into the seeds, you will get a little bit of spicy flavor because papaya seeds are spicy, so they can be used in salads, they can be from hand. So it's a, it's a nice, um, it's not something you cannot live without, but it's something nice to diversify, to diversify your orchard. And the fruit from like midsummer or late summer into the winter. And by 2020, so I planted them in 2017 and spring. So that's how they were probably by end of summer, they actually fruit as they actually produced for me the very first fruits already in the first um, in the first summer in ground, but by 2020 they were already monstrous trees. And you actually can graft females onto males. I ended up with three males and just one female. So but you can graft them. And they're very easy to grow, very easy from seed. Okay, let me see what is in chat. No, I think I don't think there is anything for me. So moving on to the fall fruits. For the fall fruits, again, I selected something unusual uh, to grow here or unusual in general. And of course, fall in Central Valley, you can get uh, a lot of different fruits from avocados and Asian pears, dragon fruits and fijoyas, papaws. Strawberry guavas, figs, um, pomegranates, of course, and the early citrus. But I'm going to show you my American persimmons, my chi, my chirimoya, my kai apples, and my sinjet. Let's start from American persimmons. I'm actually so surprised that not, not many people growing American persimmons in California. It's the second largest American native American fruit. And it has amazing flavor, in my opinion. I love Asian persimmons. I always will eat Asian persimmons, uh, which are khaki species and which are commonly available. But Diasporus Virginia, Diasporus Virginiana, coming from Eastern United States, and they have much more intense flavor. Of course, they need to be fully ripened, they need to be fully softened, and then you can eat them. But they have this amazing, strong butterscotch round flavor. And of course, they are stringent uh, until, until fully, fully soft. And different cultivars. Um, have a little bit different uh, flavor uh, flavors in them. And of course, they also fruit in different times, like if there are some early cultivars, which you can, um, you can harvest already probably from September and some cultivars um, in December, actually. So um, they have a long fruiting season from September to December. And they are and they're also beautiful trees. So I highly recommend them if, if you never if you never had them. Um, they unfortunately they cannot be grafted onto khaki. If you have Asian persimmon, uh, most likely you will not be able to graft. Some people claim that they can graft some onto hachia, but um, it's maybe one or two people just said that. You usually can graft them onto lotus. So if you have um, Lotus root stock, you can grab them on Lotus and the science are available from the East Coast, actually, the science can be obtained. Unfortunately, we cannot bring persimmon trees here from out of state, but we can bring science on graft science and Lotus root stock usually available here and we can, we can get it. So that's, uh, that's the one thing I highly recommend. Another thing, uh, which is very unusual, not many people grow it, um, it's called chia. It's actually in the Morus, um, Morus family, so it's related to mulberries and to figs, but it's clearly a fruit of its own. 
the original signs of this particular accession came actually from our uh, CRFG fellow from John in San Diego. A while ago, I was sent by another friend to his place to obtain this particular sign. There have been um, a nursery which is now extinct. It's called Oregon Exotics, and that nursery was, of course, in Oregon, and they grew and imported different exotic fruits. And this, the particular accession is um, outstanding. So there are many accessions, yeah, number of accessions of chair floating around, but it looks like that this one um, basically accepted by accepted for the flavor by anyone who tried it. And uh, I even had like people from China tasting this in my backyard and they were amazed because first of all, they never seen them such lunch. And second, they never, they never tasted them to be so tasty. They probably been exposed there. So the tree coming originally from China, these dishes, they, um, they only use a smaller and less flavorful fruit. So if you come across of this cultivar, try to grow it. It can be grafted onto Osage orange, and that's a typical rootstock you use for, uh, for chim. So it's fruiting season in November, so it's actually very late. You need to have a male and female. Well, you don't have to have a male, but females will produce smaller fruits. And I don't know, actually, if they will be as tasty as a seeded fruit. So since I have a male, I'm always getting seeded fruits. But I don't mind seeds. Seeds are relatively small, and you can swallow them. The fruits are large. The fruits are unusual. They're very sweet. To me, the flavor is like a very sweet watermelon. That's a, that's a, that's the flavor I get. And I believe that's a name. Yes, a mandarin melon berry. Yes, that's how they called anyways. Uh, when people don't use cheese, they use mandarin melon berry. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's a very high in uh, pH, so it's like a 6.5, I think, pH for this fruit, which is actually very high. Uh, next to it, I have actually juice here um, from my kai fruits, which are much more acidic fruits. Uh, so this is a juice from chair, and this is juice from um, kai apples. And here we are moving to kai apples which are fruiting a little bit earlier but also going into november so kai apples for me here are fruit from september to november i uh, grow actually some cultivars from dennis i grow his number eight and not number eight um but they unfortunately lately they didn't fruit for me but the seedlings i started from one of our crfg colleagues uh, I started them a while ago, I believe in 2014 or 15. They started producing, and from my seedlings, I selected one outstanding tree which produced outstanding fruits. First of all, they are very sweet. Uh, they are very sweet and they are very productive. So I call this uh, particular selection sweet female number four. And I also selected some male, but it's not really important. That important, which I think any male can pollinate. And some people even claim you don't need a male, but I'm not sure you will get uh, abundant production if you don't have a male. So lots of lots of fruits, but also lots of spines here. So this uh, species, if you never came across it, um, if you don't like spines, don't grow it. Uh, lots of spines, you still will have to come into contact with them because time to time you will want to prune your tree. For fruit harvest, actually, if you have your tree pruned nicely, like I did here with my, uh, with my tree, you uh, don't need to pick them one by one. You can put a shallow container right under the tree and the fruits fall into the container. You just have to pull out the container every day. And that way you can collect fruits without touching uh, your trees, touching the spines, but you still will be touching them during maintenance of the tree. Um, another selection here, which I will evaluate in my new place, is this number one, which uh, has very different fruits. It's very dense. The difference with this selection is it's a dense and it's flat, and it's a little bit darker in color. 
So we will see how this will go. But I never got many fruits from this tree yet. Um, and in the Wakadal orchard, we'll see how it will do in my new woodland orchard. Okay, Cherimoe. Of course, Cherimoe for you probably very common, uh, but it's not common here. It's not common here because we are too hot, too cold, and too dry, too windy, and uh, Cherimoes don't like it. But uh, a while ago, I actually got this tree from Margaret Frayne maybe six years ago. And this tree, this particular cultivar uh, is very uh, is very successful in my yard because um, it's an early blooming cultivar. What I found with Chirimoes, um, they for me to produce uh, fruits uh, for them, they need to bloom early. Because if, you, if they start blooming too late, when we are too hot and too dry, those flowers will not make it into the fruits. But the fortuna, which fruits very early, uh, which blooms, sorry, very early, makes it better. For example, next to it, I have albampo. And the albampo tree is actually a larger, a little bit larger tree, and one year, I think, older tree, it didn't make for me a single fruit yet. But some other cultivars I'm grafting onto El Bump actually started to produce even from the new graft. So Cherimo is under evaluation here, but what we need to do here in our hot, dry climate is we, I need to have them by eastern wall. So by eastern wall, when it gets only morning sun, it has some protection from the winds and cold, it's doing okay. So it's possible, more is possible in my climate, um, but oops, I'm not, I don't know how I'm doing it. Sorry, I will get back to Chirimois. Uh, but um, yeah, it's, it's possible, it's possible, but it's not easy here. And I don't think I will be able to grow them in the open farmland setting and woodland in the new orchard. So I don't plant any Chirimois there yet. Maybe when I will have established trees over there, when they have larger trees, maybe I interplant Chirimoe in between larger trees, but I think now it's just too early to plant them there. Okay, moving on to the next fruit, and uh, that is uh, Sanjet. If any of you from uh, Middle East, from Turkey or from Iran, or from Iraq or from Central Asian republics, you would know this fruit. Otherwise, most likely you don't. It's not common here at all, but such a fun fruit for me because when I grew up, I grew up with this fruit because uh, for us, it was a candy. When we were going back from school home and kids at that time usually been walking uh, from school back home, all the streets uh, were lined up with this trees and um, that's what we were picking in September, October, November and uh, eating them. It was a kind of um, kids food at that time. What is this fruit about? It's a powder. Uh, it's basically a dry fruit. It's a powder. So when you put this fruit, the peppery shell, which you can remove or you can actually eat and swallow it, but I usually remove it. And when you put this fruit into your mouth, basically it melts. It's a, like a cotton candy, basically, but with a lot of uh, fruity flavors. Uh, for some cultures, like for Persians, uh, this is one of the things you have to have for Navruz. Navruz. So it was Navruz in uh, Uzbekistan, Navruz, I think, in Iran. So it's one of the seven things you have to have on your table uh, during celebration in um, usually March 21, I believe. This is also was food, which always, or fruits, which always were taken by travelers on the Silk Road, because these fruits have unlimited shelf life, they are dry fruits. And the funny thing I found recently when I bought a powder of lucuma fruits, when I opened this pack and I started tasting it, I said, oh gosh, they sold me Sanjet flower, not lucuma flower, because it was so similar. And only it took me another few seconds before I actually started to taste uh, lucuma 
flavors and that meal and that flour. And so basically they're very similar. If you ever had powdered lucuma, um, you know, you can imagine how, how, how uh, sanded, uh uh, tastes. Uh, they also um, tree of love, I believe, in Persian culture, and they have absolutely amazingly smelling flowers in spring. So even once this flower, if you are passing a tree with just one flower, you will smell. It smells amazing. So yeah, so but it's something to grow, but it's not something you're going to. Uh, feast on, but it's something to just diversify your garden if you already have at least 10 other fruit trees. And moving on to the winter, um, here I selected just one fruit. Of course, in winter we have a lot of citrus. I'm still harvesting tropical guava. I still have late pomegranates. But I selected white sapote because, again, it's not common in my area. And I don't know why, because this one is actually very easy to grow in my area. And um, I grew, uh, by now, I even don't know. Right now, I cannot tell you how many cultivars I have. I have it somewhere in the database. But I fruited uh, at least 10, maybe more, 10, 12 of them. And it's very easy to find Vernon trees, Sabal trees, and um, in the box stores, just go and get yourself a Vernon tree if you never had one. I found the native fruits are very nice. I found the fish fruits are very nice too. They're actually very late and very dense fruits. Um, I really like lemon gold. I really like Santa Cruz. Amazing is false Sabal. Falso Bell came from the front and it was named Falso Bell because someone long time ago bought it under Subal name, but it's not Subal. But it's very precocious, very productive and very good tasting. Excellent. Uh, gold nugget is excellent fruit. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so what I meant to cross here, I meant to cross here Redland. I didn't mean to cross Rainbow. So the only speech or the only cultivar I really didn't like was Redland. And I tasted it from my yard. I tasted it from another friend's yard and it just hopeful for me. So if you grow a white sapota and you test tasted just Redland, make sure you taste something else because it sh you should not form your opinion based on just Redland cultivar from Florida. Rainbow is actually very good. Yeah, just, it's a mistake here. Delta Gold is a friend's introduction, Harvey's Curry introduction. Uh, he selected this particular cultivar and we registered it through CRFG. It's also very good cultivars. Basically, they're all very good. Uh, with exception of uh, Redland. Uh, the only thing for me, I only get a uh, winter fruit. I only get fruit from spring flowers. In my situation, the fall flowers, some trees will make fall flowers and they will try to make fruits, but those fruits in my condition, they will not develop through the winter. So only, spring, only fall fruit for me from the spring flowers. Uh, backyard situation is very easy to grow them. I just planted 12 of this, um, 12 new young trees uh, on in orchard in woodland, and uh, we will see how they're doing. But it will take a few years um, to see the survival and production. A small point I want to make here. When you're starting uh, growing or you're getting and to grow more and more different cultivars, one thing to always consider uh, the production and um, production and space, like some fruit, some trees will produce a lot and you will be basically living on them. But some palm trees, uh, which some people really after like gin berries and midgen berries, and I also wanted to get them and I got them and I grew them and I spent my time and my space for them. And they're fun fruit to try, but the production is so low. Uh, the space they take um, is really um, the same space, like um, 
Instead of medium berry, for example, I'm going to put a tropical guava. I'm going to pull it out, take to the farm and see if it survives here because that's my largest harvest I ever had from the medium berry. Gin berry finally died. Uh, this late frost, this spring killed it, but it produced for two, three years in my situation. And it produced about this amount of fruits you see in this picture. That's it. It's a fun fruit to try, but um, not always uh, reasonable to waste the space if you have a limited space. Gin berry is tropical, so I never will be able to grow it in open, open farmland uh, situation. But medium berry, I will experiment. Okay, so that was mostly about, that was basically, yeah, about uh, me growing different fruits and what I found are uh, some new exciting things. But the other topic I mentioned in the beginning is that I'm also very interested in plant propagation techniques. And today I finally put together this post on root grafting. And I just have a couple of slides to show you. And maybe if you have time and interest, you go onto my blog and check it uh, there. Because it's a, it's a last post from today. So what I did this spring. I had a plenty of root cuttings because I was moving large trees from one orchard setting to another orchard setting. So I had root cuttings. So I decided why not to use these root cuttings as rootstocks. And that's what I did here. And I experimented with apricots, figs, and mulberries. So basically, you take a sign, your regular sign, in this case is apricot, take a root, piece of root and put them together like you usually putting together two things when you do like a bench grafting and then i did like 10 apricots i believe and then you put them together you label them you put them into into a jar with water and after they all grafted you go pot them up and two months later uh you get a tree or not so here is a tree which was produced like uh, after two months in 10 days, something like that from here to here and here it's already doing actually field planting. So some of these are well already field planted in the new orchard. And you can see that root development here is pretty good actually in the pot for just two months because these are from mature, big mature trees which were living on ground and in, in actually open field ground. So they are not uh, stressed, uh, potted um, rootstocks we often get from the nurseries and uh, start grafting. So this was an apricot example. Um, here I'm giving you the stats what I got. So I did fix, I did two fix and um, two grafts on the fix, and both of them made it into plants. So two, two means that both made it. For the mulberries, I did 14 different grafts and 10 made it into actual plants. For apricots, I did 10 and five made it into actual trees. So here is a mulberry example. So here's a grafted and two months and uh, like a seven or 10 days later, I, I have a tree going into ground. So and this is a link to my post. Um, yeah, so just go read it if you're interested because I think I'm already about an hour. So I'm going to close pretty soon. Yeah, so uh, the main um, Probably message if you can, uh, if you want to get just one message from this talk is basically the message I wanted to deliver. Grow, tell, experiment and document. I think this is always very important. Important to grow, so you know your fruit. Important to tell, so you distribute, you give, you give them to taste, you dis distribute the material. It's important to experiment if you have resources of interest. And it's very important to document, to document your data, because there are lots of anecdotal experiences, very unorganized, but if you will be putting it somewhere online, that's really useful for others to, um, for others to learn from. And that's what I'm doing on my, on my blog. Um, that's, I think, it. Thank you so much for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions. If you guys ask questions, just make sure to speak up so the computer can hear you. Or if you want to walk up and ask, that's fine too. Yeah. 
Okay, in the chat, I already see question from, is this Babaku? No, the, I don't know if it's a question to me. No, the oak leaf papaya is not Babaku. It's, it's, uh, it's a species of itself. Babaku is a hybrid and oak leaf papaya is, a, yeah, it's a species of itself. And it's very small fruits. And it's more hardy than Babaku. Hey, Miranda, excellent talk. Um, I was wondering if you could uh, briefly tell us what you think of Young May. The question was, what do I think of Young May? Or anything specific? Um, what do you think of it flavor-wise? And what about growing any any Anything you picked up about growing it that those of us who would like to grow it should know? Yeah, I think Yang Mei is excellent fruit. Mm -hmm. I actually traveled to China. I visited a number of farms which grow Yang Mei. I tasted Yang Mei different, um, in different provinces of China and different markets. It's excellent fruit. It doesn't have much of a shelf life. But that's why I think it's really great to grow it for us. So I'm growing a few cultivars. I'm growing some seedlings of mine. And uh, I actually don't see a really big problem with growing young mice so far. I think they, well, the seedlings can die easily. And um, with, but I think it's a pest. It's, um, it's some pests and some pathogens can do it for them when they are very young. Also maybe some root problems, but the established trees are incredibly vigorous. So in terms of um, soil, I always add sand uh, if I get chance. But to be honest, right now I planted, I don't add sand. I just don't have time. I had a lot of gypsum on my farm before planting anything. So basically gypsum does a similar thing to the clay soil. Uh, protect from sun, of course, when they're young. Um, what else? Uh, because in China, I think the upper temperatures they're experiencing about 90 degrees. Well, be well over 100. Today, I think we've been 105 in May. Uh, snow, I don't think it's, um, yeah, but it's not your problem at all. But I don't think cold um, is a problem at all for young May. In China, it grows to very northern provinces. Um, uh, a graft, um, try to use uh, some uh, local rootstocks. If you go online, you will see what people are experimenting with. I have a good experience with Pennsylvania, uh, Mirica Pennsylvania. So, um, but um, I don't have a long-term experience how it will behave. But in these few years I grow it, Pennsylvania seems to be a good rootstock, but it has its own problems. It sprouts a lot. So you can make, of course, more rootstocks, but you always have to fight it. And Pennsylvania is much thinner than Young May itself. So what I'm doing now with my plants, I'm pulling them. So I'm basically building soil. So hoping that they will make their own roots too. What else? The cultivars, yeah, just get what you can get. So I just recently imported with a group two couple of cultivars. Um, um, maybe I will, out of four plants I imported, um, I think one is only alive, but I did the grafts. So I will get a graft from uh, at least that cultivar, but one cultivar I don't think I'm recovering at all. I don't know. Yeah, if you have yeah any specific questions, I'm um, yeah happy to answer about young May or anything else. Hey Marta, a yeah. uh, question for you on the rootstock that you used in the apricot grafting example. I'm just wondering how you either produced it or created it, um, and you know what what kind of plant that was. Thanks. 
So apricot rootstocks, all these root grafting experiments started because I was moving trees from one orchard to another. What it means? I have to dig out a large tree and then I have to prune roots before it. In my case, I had to pot them first because my land wasn't ready. So pruning roots, that's how I ended up with a lot of root cuttings. So the rootstock was apricot seedling, actually. It was two apricot seedlings I had. I didn't label which one, but they both are like apricots of Central Asian origin. They were seedlings of small white apricots. That's, that's it. That's all I can tell you. And they were from trees which are about uh, four years old and ground. So that's, that's it. Yeah. So apricot seedlings from white, small white apricots, that's those were the roots. So you grafted directly on a root cutting that didn't have any stem, is that correct? That's correct, yes. There are tons of details on my uh, on my blog, but yeah. So yeah, see, this is just a piece of root. Just a piece of root, whatever. It's actually an old technique. I didn't invent this. It's an old technique used in many tropical countries. Um, somehow it's not popular here, but I know that people in North uh, East, they do, they use it for some trees. Yeah, piece of root directly. Yeah, so I think the, fa uh, the failed grafts, which ones like a five of apricots didn't make it, five grafts, I think the connection, so basically what, what you will notice when you start doing it, you will notice that uh, the bark of stem and the bark of fruit, they are very, they have very different thickness. So I was trying to match as best as I could, uh, going like a cambium uh, of the stem, you have basically to insert it deeper into the roots than if you would be matching stem to stem because the bark is uh, thicker for the root. Great, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Cool, I think you had something in the chat. Can the American persimmon be grafted with food? you, chocolate, etc.? Uh, no. So some people claimed that they can graft American persimmon to Hachia. So if you really want to do that, I would start with Hachia because at least someone claimed that it's possible. I tried, no. I tried on many different ones and no graft, but I didn't try Hachia. Um, uh, non work So you have to get lotus. And you can get lotus very easily, actually. Lotus uh, rootstocks can be obtained from fruit and wood nursery in uh, Northern California. I bought uh, lotus rootstocks from them. And there are lotus seeds usually available. And um, for me, uh, most of my American persimmon grafts on lotus pork. There might be also some incompatibility. But actually, you even can find Virginiana. Uh, after living like almost 20 years in Davis, I realized, wow, we have Virginiana trees here producing Virginiana, Virginiana trees at UC Davis Arboretum. I was traveling before to Chica to find Virginiana trees, to Chica, US, former USDA research station, and they have Virginianas over there. But that, and that's how I also, that's another option to make just actual Virginiana rootstocks and use them. Um, there's a question. How many chill hours does the American persimmon usually need? That I don't know. That I don't know. Okay. Um, but I suspect not many actually because they grow up to the, um, up to the Florida, I think. Not, uh, there, yeah, so there, yeah, in Louisiana. So I think you should try. In Southern California, you should try them. Cool. 
Is anybody growing up in some of this? It's still really small though, but it's only about maybe two years old. Um, it's just, it's not very big yet. <laughs> I have a uh, black chipotle, which is uh, yeah. for some of my family. Right. Well, cool. It's fruity. Well, if you have any more questions, Marta, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And make sure to check out her website, um, which I think we sent out in the email link, uh, right? Yeah, yeah. With the email link. Yeah. Yep, yep. Take a picture of your phone if you want, um, or remember it, or write it down. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Have a great night, Marta. Um, yeah, yeah. Thank okay, you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the invitation.